And it's time for another sample from the classic album archives with Richard Skinner. Whatever the wishful thinking of artists and record companies, it often takes several albums to establish an act. But when the record we're about to hear was released, the group's discography amounted to just one single, a taster that made the top 20. The album contained three more top 10 hits and would have spawned another two at least, except four singles from one album seemed quite enough in those days. The year is 1982, and our classic album is ABC's The Lexicon of Love. Looking back with me for the next hour is Martin Fry. Lexicon of Love is a very intense record, really. Stuff happens each millisecond. Um, it's not a very relaxed record, it's quite a neurotic record. I guess it's a reflection of where we were at at the time as well, you know, we were like champing at the bit, you know, we wanted to make a great, great record. ABC's debut single, Tears Are Not Enough, had been produced by Steve Brown. But although it was a hit, Fry and fellow members Mark White, Steve Singleton and David Palmer still weren't satisfied. We had a good relationship with Steve Brown, but we realised the kind of record we wanted to make was more cinematic. We always wanted to sort of marry um, funk and soul records we'd hear on a dance floor and at the time that would be Sister Sledge and Chic and Earth, Wind and Fire marry that with the kind of sensibility you were getting from records by people like Joy Division and The Cure I mean that was our background you know we were post-modernists I guess you know living, lads living up in Sheffield in Yorkshire and, and marry the two so we wanted a more polished sound and we heard this record called Handheld in Black and White by Dollar um, Dollar if you can remember were like a peroxide to Tucson very much from the world of show business, I guess. Very much from a sort of light entertainment <clears throat> world. But this guy called Trevor Horn had, had made this record that sounded like a Steven Spielberg movie. You know, it was like it had highs and lows. It was operatic. And that was like Mark White suggested to, to me that we should um, try and get this guy to produce the record. Um, his first reaction to us was, um, why do you want me to produce you? He, he couldn't understand why we needed a producer if we were having hit records but he did see that what we were doing was very raw and he said he liked that quality but we said we didn't you know we wanted to do something we wanted to be like the only other people that were really inspiring us at the time was james chance and the contortions who also had an alter ego james white and the blacks on z records he was fusing disco music with something anarchic you know and also the pop group who were a very influential uh, group from bristol mark stewart was the lead singer they seem to represent a way forward. Uh, also, we, were, we wanted to make like three and a half minute epics. You know, we really wanted an epic quality, like an operatic quality almost, where there's highs and lows, there are peaks, a big finish, you know, all within three and a half, four minute tracks. You know, that was, we wanted to embrace like pop, you know, it was like a dirty word at the time. It was like really melodic, right? the music to be really melodic. Um, we, we were trying a lot of things out, so there was no great master plan um, to begin with and no real formula to work on. We'd never made an album before. And as I say, Trevor Horn, he got a, his team there from doing a couple of singles with Dollar, but it wasn't like there was a strict route we were following. It was very much feeling through, and it was very much from the first day of recording right to the last day of, re of mixing. But, um, yeah, with Trevor, it was like, you could just see a gleam in his eye. We, wanted, we also wanted to make a record that sounded like Frank Sinatra, with Fairlights, you know, we like the idea of fusing uh, crooning and, and almost what Frank Sinatra would be doing if he was like 21 in 1981, uh, if that makes sense. There was, we wanted a level of sophistication and we, we wanted the songs to reflect that and we wanted the sound to reflect that. Um, Show Me is the first track and um, since it, it comes out of the traps as number one, we wanted something dramatic melodramatic to start it off um, and we struck on the idea of maybe doing like an overture almost you know where is that the right term whereby um, there's an orchestrated piece of music there that features a lot of the melodies from the rest of the album it's just a very straightforward uh, song a demonstration of, uh, of intent you know show me cry for help something that just hit you between the eyes and we, we opened up live with it as well I love Motown. I loved Motown when I was a kid and I love it now. Motown was always um, the epitome of uh, white musicians, black musicians meeting, you know, got very big cosmopolitan records that were meant to be instant that uh, lasted three and a half minutes. And yet a lot of um, songs from the Motown roster will last forever, you know, Holland Dozier's 
Holland's songs. When they came out, maybe they were regarded as just, you know, pop records for the moment, but um, that's forever. So, yeah, I mean, I've plundered Smokey Robinson left, right and centre. Uh, show me, show me secondary motion. It's like a cross-reference to uh, one of Smokey Robinson's songs. Show me was the closest thing we got to a Motown track, I guess. I mean, I went to uh, study English literature at um, Sheffield University for want of a better thing to do. I'm glad I did. I met Mark White, I met Steve Singleton. We formed ABC in Sheffield. But I've always liked, I mean, I love pop music, but I like it when it's literate, not in a pretentious way, but in a way that makes it memorable, you know, and really touches people. And that, that's how it touches me, you know, and, and still does. If you hear something that really, it, it hits you musically, but it also might hit you lyrically, you know. Uh, yeah, with, at the time, people weren't really writing, apart from Elvis Costello, people weren't really writing songs that rhymed, you know. And we did try and push ourselves back into a more, I don't know, we, we I listened to a lot of um, stuff like either Cole Porter or through Frank Sinatra's records or, or people like Backrack and David as well and, and um, Holland Dozier Holland and Smokey Robinson and, and Marvin Gaye, great writers. I'm talking about them all as writers of songs. Um, so it was, it was a lot of the lyrics rhyme on um, this record and it, that was sort of it, when you make something rhyme you, you, set, you listen to a Bob Dylan song he makes one line rhyme then another then another and there's a lot of fun in trying to do that um, and that is very much the case uh, with a track like Show Me the cowboys at the rodeo the rhinestones on that Romeo that kind of thing but uh, we wanted with Show Me to do something emotional as well to have an emotional call I got tired of people singing about electric pylons and stuff like that and at the time you have to throw your mind back to the early 80s that was very much the sort of way people wrote that's why I, I'm generalizing but you know in modern pop music at the time you know it was all very um, Gary Newman you know we wanted to be like bringing the tears to your eyes and stuff like that whether or not we did you know we really wanted to have an emotional sort of uh, push you know um, Poison Arrow was our uh, calling card really as I say Tears Not Enough was our first single but Poison Arrow was our first mega hit it was a hit in many places around the world and it was the first track we recorded with um, Trevor Horn with Gary Lennon um, we recorded the sessions I think November December period it was cold in uh, London in like Rack Studios we did some drums and um, moved over to Psalm East which is on Brick Lane which is where we ended up doing most of the record. But I remember vividly, you know, when you finished uh, recording, before you mix the record, you take a cassette home, a monitor mix, you know. And um, it was a tail end, mid-December, I think we we did a couple of weeks, I mean, it must have been mid-December, 81. And um, the five of us got in the van and went up to Sheffield. And I remember the van broke down somewhere just outside of Sheffield in Chesterfield, and we just turned off the motorway. And it was snowing. And the only cassette we had while we were waiting for the AA man was a, a monitor mix of Poison Arrow. I must have listened to that track about a hundred times. But I knew then, you know, we all did, that we stumbled across something pretty good, you know. We were confident. It, was, it excited us, you know. Sometimes you can make a record that doesn't excite you. You have to kid yourself. But we definitely felt the old, apart from the temperature, we felt the old uh, shiver down our spine on that one. Poison Arrow was the first um, opportunity we got to shoot a video. Prior to that, I mean, uh, it's now the video age, um, you know, everybody makes videos, but we had to fight long and hard for, um, to get some money together to um, shoot a video. Prior to that, Adam Ant had made a few videos and Top of the Pops had made a few films, you know, sort of next to tracks of artists that refused to appear, I guess. But we hooked up with Julian Temple, um, who made the great rock and roll swindle. And he, like Trevor Horn, seemed to, what, what Trevor did with the music, Julian Temple did visually. He put us in like a, a different context. And I think by making the video for Boys Now, it definitely thrust us up into people's faces, you know. It definitely meant people got to know what we were doing, definitely. That's an understatement. Um, the Boys Now, you know, I've, I've obviously got very fond memories of it because it was our first big, big hit record. And, you know, it's weird becoming. Um, famous you know if you like I mean you, you, 
I don't really regard myself as famous compared to the cast of Coronation Street, but um, it was the first time we were on top of the pops. It was something that I dreamt of for a long time. You know, I think if anyone asked the question honestly and look at themselves, they must have been pushing, pushing, and you know, with that sort of will to try and be successful, you know, and to be in the public eye. But yeah, it does. Nothing prepares you for um, a hit record, a big hit record. Nothing. You know, there's. I don't know how to describe it. It's like suddenly everybody knows what you're doing, or it seems that way. You know, I know it's just a piece of plastic on the charts, but. You know, suddenly your grandma knows what you do for a living, you know. Suddenly, you know, the guy driving the cab does. If you're, you know, top of the pops, you've got a big hit. Plus, you're suddenly thrust to a point where you're sort of with your peers on an equal basis, you know what I mean? It's weird, you know. You go and do top of the pops, and at the time, we'd be there, and, oh, Rock, EB40, you know, Robert Palmer's there, and I don't know, Madness were there, you know, a group that I loved at the time, you know. And, you know, the dressing rooms next door, there's all of that goes on, you know. It's a real joyride, you know, and it's something everybody should try and experience at some point in their life, you know, in whatever field. It's very exciting. Many Happy Returns was a song that was kicking around for quite a long time. But what we did do in the studio was develop the introdu uh, an introduction to it, where we welded two tracks. And um, it's a real gumshoe, detective, Raymond Chandler type of tune. And I get to mumble. A little uh, soliloquy at the beginning of the song. May have returns is like, I mean, what a dumb title, <laughs> you know. Tessa Niles sang on it. Many happy returns. And she crops it later on in, uh, to duet briefly with me on um, date dance. It was nice to um, bring in a female voice. Trevor's philosophy at the time was, look, and it was one we shared. He believes that like musicians, in a way, are ten a penny. There are many great musicians around, but one good idea is what makes a good track, or makes a good record, or makes something that touches people. So his philosophy was, yeah, if you can dial a pizza, you should be able to start, pick up the phone and dial somebody to come down and play oboe or a clarinet, you know? And that's a, it's not, it, it, it wasn't something people were doing in the ten years prior. You know, through the 70s, people were making records in a slightly different way, particularly in Britain. I mean, I'm generalizing, but in the, in the main, um, you know, we wanted to make it in the sort of disco tradition as well, you know, where you pull on board everything. And, and the song was the most important thing. When you're a musician, you first go into a recording studio, it's like you're looking at yourself under a microscope and you see the flaws within the band musically and everything else. But uh, Steve Brown did a great job um, on Tears Not Enough. Uh, the record came out and I think it got to number 19 in the UK charts. Tears Not Enough um, was recorded originally when was it recorded? Early 81, but we um, re-recorded or added to the track when we decided we were going to put it on The Lexicon of Love. It's a tarted up version, you know. It's a remix. <laughs> we did a few key things. Significant things. It's like to find that we had to repair that. You've got a house, right? And the roof's good and the, the walls are good and the um, upstairs is good, but the foundations were a bit rocky. <laughs> Some of the drumming was uh, a little out of time originally. So Dave Palmer repaired it, as I remember, with a pulse. And we put a, um, a Munster's um, harpsichord solo in the middle. Valentine's Day. I guess I threw in, lyrically, a lot of all that teenage angst into, um, into a lot of the songs on the Lexicon 11. In a funny kind of way, I think that's what the appeal is. Everybody's had a broken heart. So Valentine's Day, yeah, it's a sort of, it's an intense one, that, with a xylophone solo. When the postman don't call on Valentine's Day. Yeah, it builds and it builds and it builds, like when like you're singing it in a ring or something, you know? I forget the proper term for that. There's no real chorus to it, particularly. But it was just a chance to let loose. Valentine's Day, from our classic album, ABC's Lexicon of Love. And the next track is The Look of Love. In a funny kind of way, I guess The Look of Love it's the kind of song people most strongly associate with ABC, with what we've done, amongst others, but I wanted to do a very romantic song. But a song that was um, really grooved, grooved in the way that um, Change, you remember Change, the group, an Italian group that um, Luther Vandross used to sing with, Lover's Holiday and uh, Searching. I, I mean, Change were like very rever reverential to Chic and Sister Sledge, very very sophisticated uh, dance records that use strings dramatically. 
I don't know, the look of love just kind of fell together beautifully. We were recording it. We recorded it after Poison Arrow, I think, in Good Earth Studios on Dean Street in Soho. And um, kind of midway through the recording, Tony Visconti owns the studio. And Tony Visconti obviously produced a lot of David Bowie records. Now, you can never undervalue the influence of Bowie, Bolden, and Roxy Music stuff on us and on, I'd say, about 90% of uh, groups that have made music in Britain over the last 10 years at least. Um, now, unfortunately, I had to go and do an interview down the street at Sound. But Bowie turns up, doesn't he? This probably see that the Tony has gone to just to hang out. You know, this is the hour I'm out of the studio. So Bowie pops his head around the door and sort of starts chatting on and He's listening to the track. And I guess he liked it. So um, his suggestion for the middle bit, because we got, we got good at doing middle bits of records, the middle eight, but we, it was always the, the blank space. We'd like to kind of... Um, you know, you know what the chorus is going to be, you know what the verse is going to be, you can have some fun there. He, his suggestion um, to Trevor was that it should be an answering machine message, and that it should be me, keep phone, or the, me, the singer, phoning up, leaving these messages on an answering machine, which is a great idea, because the look of love is about, again, being thrown out into the street, you know, when the world is full of strange you know, the girl of your dreams has, has left you, kind of thing, in a nutshell. Uh, that was a good suggestion, so I thought, well, no, we can't have him uh, influence the record, I have to come up with something better. So in the great tradition of Barry White, I, I did this little speech, which haunts me to this day, which as I remember goes something like, I can't remember the speech. Um, people ask me, maybe one day you'll find true love. Now, is that corny? Or is that corny? But somehow, when it took off the song, it worked, you know, and everybody was laughing in the studio and stuff, and we stuck it in, you know, and sort of, it's a memorable sort of bit, you know. <laughs> Ten years later, people go, some out him. Have you found true love? <laughs> <laughs> the look of love um, was a very good big hit record for his also, you know, it was like the um, follow-up to point now. And it also meant we met, it, it showed people we own business in a way, because you can, if you, if you sometimes you can stumble across the head, but the hardest thing in the world is following, following one up. And it still is to this day, and it is for everybody. So the look at the got from behind me. So I think uh, Barry sprinkled a bit of his magic dust there. And again, we used uh, strings on that record quite subtly. We didn't want, as I say, we didn't want to swamp the uh, damn record with uh, hammy strings, but um, Anne Bowie's string arrangement on the look of the is very, very unique, very tasteful. Excellent, like that. With the Look of Love as well, we made Look of Love Part 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and the 12-inch. We really stripped the track down and um, Trevor and Guy Lang and went to work. So uh, Look of Love comes in five parts, yeah. So you got a good idea. <laughs> Milk it. <laughs> Date stamp, um, the track got played heavily, as I remember, I'm going back now, at Camden Palace. Rusty Egan used to... Pound it out. I think it was his favourite song. He used to be the DJ down there. It was like a sort of semi theme tune for that period. Um, a song about consumerism. A song about buying and selling and how you can buy and sell yourself. So making a record is, to some extent, outside of the art. You know, it's 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 putting yourself on the line, standing in the spotlight and saying, you know, love me for what I am. You know, that's what any artist does, I guess. Um, it originally started off as a funk track. Um, we put cash registers on. <laughs> it's like a sample of a cash register played back on the track with a fair light. <laughs> now the song date stamps, uh, yes, on date stamps, you know, like, like bacon in Sainsbury's or something. You know, everything fades away. Nothing lasts forever, that's the idea behind the song. Date stamps like a, a man chatting to a woman, you know? So it makes sense to sort of throw it around, you know, uh, with a male book on a female book on. But um, Tessa Niles uh, came down, I think, and um, it was great, we got like um, I mean, over an album, I guess people, I mean, Christ, people must get bored of my voice. That's why I tend to sort of sing falsetto or lover. But it was great to break it up. Um, is Monsieur a connoisseur or just sure it changed? Off the record, custom fitted, all means the same. We, we split the lines up, you know, um, which was new to us because our background was playing live on, you know, in the rehearsal room or just on stage. You know, we, didn't, we never used backing vocals. 
but um, yeah, Dave Stamp um, chugs along nicely. My only regret about the Mexican I love, looking back now, I mean, these days people take, like, they might take all the single, every track might be a single, you know, if you're record time. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's such a good thing. But you've got like your Michael Jackson, or you can bet Dire Straits will do it, or your, your Tina Turner's of this world. For us to bring more than two singles off an album at the time was regarded, maybe by itself, as, as pushing it a bit, you know? Pushing it. I mean, the, the background for English groups was definitely to do it the way New Order did almost, whereby, or Roxy Music originally in the early 70s, they, they bring, the singles weren't even on the album. You know, it's been a single off an album. So my regret looking back in a way is, I mean, a track like Dave Stamp would have been beautiful as a single. Or even, you know, a track like Valentine's Day perhaps. But we didn't want to milk it to the point. But by bringing four singles off this album, we thought that was a bit, pushing it a bit, man, you know. <laughs> Tears Not Enough was like, um, you know, top 20 here, I suppose. Just the first one. Poison Arrow, The Look of Love, and All of My Heart were all, yeah, big top five records. All of my heart was, um, we wanted to do a ballad, and most ballads are preposterous, aren't they? I mean, some are beautiful. I mean, nowadays there's a tradition of the power ballad, you know? You get your Guns N' Roses and your uh, Brian Adams there. Um, I guess people love an emotional song, you know? I do. We're all romantics at heart. But um, I've got to admit, I was trepidatious about a singing a ballad, because, you know, if the track's slower and you, you're the singer, you're more exposed, you know? You really are. I'm talking from purely a selfish point of view but um, Mark White and myself and Steve Singleton we were fooling around with this country and western idea all of my heart remembering surrendering and I remember Trevor going no no you should do that but not in a country and western style you should do like a ballad you know and um, Trevor guaranteed it would be a top five hit you know or, or you give us a hundred quid each you know something like that so I guess uh he won the bet. With a lot of the songs on Alexa Gonna Love, we wanted to start, and that usually meant a fairly dramatic or melodramatic intro, as we said earlier. And we wanted to finish when it to peak at a certain point, climb the mountain and bang, hit the precipice or whatever, you know. Uh, with All of My Heart, um, the original version is a lot, lot longer. In that it's quite, it gets quite ambient. And Steve Singleton um, played alto and tenor sax on the album. Um, you know, he got his chance to um, take it out on the fade. Whereas a lot of the other tracks would dramatically, we'd rearrange them, or we'd compress them, or we'd um, rework them. So, all of my heart, it was just nice to relax the mood and go out on a more sort of ambient, looser kind of feel. Uh, if you listen carefully, folks, at the end of each chorus, it goes, Remembering, surrendering, remembering my heart. All of my heart. There's a pause, and we thought, yeah, how are we going to squeeze this for maximum intensity? So uh, Guy Langan and Trevor Holland hit on the idea of making the space longer each time at the end of each chorus. So the three choruses, and it goes, da da da, bang, all of my heart. And so the next time it goes, bang, all of my heart. And for the third one, we want a real pregnant pause, you know? <laughs> Twins. So. Gary put a bit of blank tape in to the um, multi-track, I think. So it's like this really weird bang. All of my heart. So if you're not, you know, weeping into your hanky by then, but you get a harder stone. And I used to live in some flats up in Hyde Park Flats in Sheffield, right? I think it's, in the Guinness Book of Records, is the highest concentration of people living in one area. The architect, if he's not killed himself, should have done it. But I was, um, I was living up there at the time I wrote the song. And on one of the lifts was forever, together, four years to come. Yeah, four to but, And um, that was the basis of the lyric. Forever Together is probably the most experimental um, track in the way it was recorded. Uh, just try a few innovative things out at the time. And um, we wanted it to be epic. Voice of God time. And it never goes away, you know. I got a chance to uh, keep singing on that one. And get me on three coins in a fountain. Forever together. The lexicon of love ends with an instrumental reprise of The Look of Love. Yeah, uh, we reprised uh, The Look of Love because um, the string sounds so beautiful. And it was the ideal way to uh, wave bye-bye. 
full crop into the sunset. Um, you never finish an album, you know? I'd want to I'd redo the artwork now. <laughs> it's like when the tapes go off to the factory to be um, mass-produced, you still want to chase the band down the street. But um, and I guess it's our calling card. Sometimes, you know, it felt like we were living in its shadow because it was such a successful record. I don't feel that now. I'm very pleased people have an affection for you know, a piece of work they've done, the group's done. Um, and it's the foundation to everything we've done since. Classic Albums is produced by John Pigeon. I'm Richard Skinner. Our special thanks to Martin Fry.